That's where Intel, the American company that helped build Silicon Valley, is going to build a $20 billion semiconductor megasite, up to eight state-of-the-art factories in one place, 10,000 new jobs. And in those factories, the average job about $135, $135,000 a year. Some of the most sophisticated manufacturing in the world to make com computer chips the size of a fingertip. The power of the world in everyday lives, from smartphones, technology, to the internet, technology is yet to be invented. But that's just the beginning. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, who was here tonight, I don't know where Pat is. Pat, there you go, Pat, stand up. Tuesday, July 19th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but we start with this. We have a lot of viewers in this program from the United Kingdom, specifically from London. Unfortunately, the city is facing a historic heat wave, lots of fires all over the place, so our thoughts, the people over there, and hope that our viewers are doing fine and that the worst is behind us. And with that out of the way, let's start the show and we begin with the macroeconomics discussion that I got for you tonight and it is an important one so here it is in focus the great heist the so-called chips act that they're selling right now as vital importance to our national security is nothing mere than just another act in the series of abuses by the government of taxpayer money that's all there is now you might be aware that we have a chip shortage every time you hear about inflation or supply chain problems your products are not here they're going to take longer to arrive etc etc they give you the excuse that we have a shortage of chips and the reason behind that is the thing the virus let me ask you a question did the virus kill all the chips in the world all of a sudden did the virus shut down all factories that manufacture chips around the world even today they're still closed or is there something more to it let's backtrack back in 2020 when the thing hit, also known as the Great Panic of 2020, governments decided to shut down and lock down economies, including factories that manufacture chips. And therefore, we got an imbalance between supply and demand. Supply went down. And as a response to the Great Panic and the lockdowns and the economic devastation that happened because of that, the Central Bank of the World, the Federal Reserve of the United States, decided to unleash the biggest tsunami of liquidity in human history, printing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars all over the place all of these trillions floated back to the economy mostly to the rich the oligarchs the corporations a lot of those trillions also floated in the economy in forms of stimulus also known as stimmies all of a sudden whether you lost your job or not the government got you back you don't have to pay your bills anymore you don't have to pay your rent anymore the consumer all of a sudden did not have to go out and spend in the economy dining out traveling etc etc and therefore they saw their savings rate increasing dramatically and hence the purchasing power of consumers also improved dramatically on top of that the government used all of that tsunami of liquidity in giving away stimulus checks all over the place stimmies all over the place and we also saw the stock market surging higher along with other bubbles assets like cryptos for example real estate values moved higher all of this dynamic created an insane level of demand that is unprecedented we've never seen such a surge in demand in a short amount of time mind you the supply was still short now consumers with all of this newly founded wealth be it from stimmies or a rise in real estate value, savings rates, stock portfolios, crypto portfolios, the purchasing power all of a sudden shot up higher among consumers. And now they splurged in buying goods from Amazon online. They bought laptops, phones, tablets, TVs, appliances, electronics. As a result, 
inventories were drained across the economy. Now all of these suppliers have to replenish their inventories, so they place orders. That produced a massive surge in demand on chips. Chips happen to be found pretty much in everything we use today, specifically electronics. Now when you have factories being shut down across the globe, you have workers not showing up, etc., etc., all of that demand becomes back ordered. Now these suppliers of chips are overwhelmed. They have an insane level of demand that they have to catch up with. Meanwhile, their factories are shut down, their workers are nowhere to be found, and they cannot get the supplies of materials they need to produce these chips in time. And hence we got the imbalance between demand and supply, and we saw chips prices surging dramatically, increasing the cost of living, and hence we got inflation. But there is another factor that also contributed to the insane surge of demand on chips, and that factor is the green agenda, specifically the EV lunacy. Car manufacturers shut down their assembly lines for gas combustion engines and they transitioned to electric vehicles. The problem is they did this transition abruptly while the supplies to manufacture these electric vehicles were nowhere to be found and therefore we got a shortage of supply in cars pushing the prices of cars higher and hence we got inflation. Take a look. By now you have likely heard of the semiconductor shortage and how the lack of chips is impacting supplies. Take for instance an electric car. The Secretary of Commerce said last week these cars use around 2,000 different chips. That's double the number used in a non-electric car. It's one reason why there are vehicle buying delays nationwide. So each EV uses double the amount of chips that regular cars use. That will double the demand all of a sudden. When you have Ford, GM, European manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers, all of a sudden all shifting into EVs, that produces an insane surge of demand. There is no way the supply chain can catch up with that in a short amount of time. Even when the supply goes back to average, and we're seeing factories already reopened in China and other places, some would argue that we don't have any shortage of supply really because factories are back in order. But even if you argue that we need to improve the supply chain to go back to average, it will still be short the insane level of demand. And hence the imbalance between demand and supply will still be with us. So what is the solution here? Do we increase supply dramatically by building factories all over the place to cope with this insane unsustainable that is the key word unsustainable level of demand what is the risk in doing that number one you're going to get more inflation because you're spending more you're going to compete in workers that increases wage inflation you're going to compete on resources to build these factories that increases inflation higher on top of that you risk the fact that you could end up having oversupply while the demand due to the economic cycle shifting from inflation to stagflation to a recession, the demand suddenly goes down. And we found ourselves in the opposite problem. We have an oversupply of chips while the demand wanes down. And that produces a recession. That produces margins of chip makers to be crushed because they have to take a loss in selling these products. The point being here is the solution of increasing supply is not realistic and it's not advised, economically speaking. It is moronic, to say the least. The actual solution should be reducing demand right now for the Fed to slow down the economy by increasing interest rates so that insane level of demand cools down and by doing so, reducing the hill that the supply chain has to climb to meet demand. Yet the chip manufacturing industry, the CEOs and the promoters of the so-called CHIPS Act, they sell it as, if we don't do this, if we don't increase the supply of chips, we're going to be in a world of trouble economically speaking, and inflation will stick with us. We're not going to solve inflation until we increase the supply dramatically, in this case the supply of chips. But what about reducing the demand? Isn't it more realistic as a solution to reduce the demand right now rather than spend all of these billions to increase the supply and risk higher inflation or perhaps the opposite problem of being oversupplied? Listen to Pat Gilsinger, the CEO of Intel, listen to his response to this question. Do you welcome softness in the economy right now as, as a company that's been at the center of the chip shortage, which is driven by obviously supply chain problems, but also this huge pickup we've seen in demand? Yeah, you know, I think of it through two lenses. You know, I mean, one is you never, you, you know, everybody wants to be up and to the right forever. But we always know that's never the case. And as we are rebuilding Intel, you know, this is a good time for me in the sense that, hmm, you know, a little bit of austerity you know, as we're uh, addressing and uh, rebuilding the company just helps me to drive change more rapidly. But also with the significant shortages that we've seen now for multiple years and forecasted to last for a couple of more years, a little bit of reprieve in the market 
hopefully will allow us to catch up a bit more rapidly and get to a better supply-demand balance situation. So he does acknowledge that the demand is a problem, and reducing that demand by a little bit will help improve the supply versus demand dynamic. But he also insists that this is a supply problem, that regardless, we need to increase the supply of chips. Why? Because there is more money to these chip manufacturers in adopting the solution of increasing supply versus adopting the solution of reducing demand. Specifically, the solution of increasing supply comes by free handout from the government, billions and billions of dollars, courtesy of the taxpayer, to help these companies to increase the supply by building them factories, and doing their R&D work for them free of charge. It's an excellent deal. You'll take it. I'll take it. If I was a CEO of Intel, if the government wants to hand me free cash to solve the chip supply problem, I'm taking that cash. The problem is, is funding to build factories for chip makers an urgent economic need of vital national interest? Or is it just another abuse of taxpayer money to pass another handout to all of these corporations, the donors to the politicians. Let's see. Listen to President Joe Biden earlier this year during the State of the Union, what he said about Intel investing in the economy. Take a listen. Pat came to see me and he told me they're ready to increase their investment from 20 billion to 100 billion. That would be the biggest investment in manufacturing in American history. And all they're waiting for is for you to pass this bill. So let's not wait any longer. Send it to my desk. I'll sign it. Now, does that make sense at all? Intel, out of their generosity, of course, they want to increase their investment in this country from $20 billion to $100 billion. But they need the taxpayer to give them a $52 billion handout first to unlock that investment of $100 billion. Now, does that make sense to anybody at all? What's going on here? Here's the reality of all of this. The House of Representatives recently passed the America Competes Act, which aims to make the U.S. more competitive with other countries, such as China. Really? Or was that just another money laundering scheme? Anyways, it includes provisions from the Chip for America Act, which would give $52 billion to semiconductor chip manufacturers with the goal of bringing the production of chips back to the U.S. as demand for the technology rises. The bill will also give a boost to tech companies such as AMD, Samsung, and Intel, all of which spent money lobbying on issues facing the semiconductor chips industry last year. AMD began lobbying for the Chips for America Act in 2020 when it spent a total of $1.7 million in lobbying. In 2021, AMD spent over $4 million lobbying on trade issues, such as the Chips for America Act, and issues in science and technology. AMD was able to keep a steady supply of chips due to the fact that they were able to set up contracts prior to the shortage and that 29 of their operations are located in the Asian Pacific versus the 11 operations in the United States. Samsung, an electronics company based in South Korea, also had the Chips for America Act as one of their lobbying bills. In 2020, Samsung spent over $3.3 million lobbying with over $1 million spent in the third quarter overall. The company's spending increased slightly to $3.7 million in 2021 and lobbied on issues in telecommunications and manufacturing. Last year, Samsung also announced that the company would build a $17 billion factory in Texas to combat the chip shortage, hoping to have it operating by 2024. Intel also lobbied for the Chips for America Act starting in 2020, when the company's total was over $3 million. Last year, the U.S. Multinational Technology Corporation spent over $4 million in lobbying on an array of issues including the chip shortage, telecommunications, science, and technology. Pay attention now, because all of these companies are spending millions and millions of dollars in lobbying, but they're crying poverty when they're asked to build their own factories. So keep that in mind. Last year, the Senate passed a similar bill called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act that also included addressing the chip shortage. Like the House's bill, it would provide $52 billion in funding for U.S. chip manufacturing. With two bills tackling the same issues, the next step would be for the Senate and the House to reconcile their bills, then send their final version to President Joe Biden to sign. Otherwise... They're going to blackmail the government, their employees, and everybody. Take a listen once again to Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. And I'm just baffled, right? You know, frustrated, anxious to see this come across the line as they're now in this uh, conference process. And without some certainty of that, 
you know, as we said when we announced the uh, Ohio project, we can either go slow and small with the project, and we'll just do a couple of fab modules there this decade, or we can go big and bold and uh, go from 20 billion up to 100 billion. But in absence of certainty of getting that across the line, it just didn't seem prudent, you know, for us to be barreling as aggressively ahead and to send a clear message to Congress. We need this done. So he says we got two options. If the bill doesn't pass, the handout worth $52 billion to Intel, oh, we're just going to go small in our investment in this country. Or we can go big and bold. If you give us the handout, if you give us free cash, courtesy of the taxpayer, if you subsidize our investment, then we'll go big and bold. Isn't this socialism for corporations? Now, if you are an American citizen and you complain about the status of health care in this country, you ask, hey, wait a minute here. How come when I break a leg, I have to go bankrupt to pay the bills, the medical bills? How come my government doesn't provide me with free or even affordable access to health care. You get accused of being a socialist, a communist. What do you think? This is Cuba? This is the United States of America. We have capitalism here. Get a job, bump. But when it comes to these corporations, oh, we don't have a problem at all, giving them handouts and subsidies to build their factories. You see how the system works? It's an oligarchy. It's not really capitalism. It's gangsterism. A wise Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger so excited about the passing of the CHIP Act. He's all over TV. If you don't pass the bill, the world will end. You gotta pass the bill, pass the bill, pass the bill. Maybe he's so excited because he bought his stock recently, waiting for the act to pass. An Intel stock will shoot up higher, and CEO Pat Gilsinger makes easy money. Of course he's excited. Mind you, this guy makes 1,711 times more than the average company worker in Intel. He's making a load of cash. And by the way, I have my suspicions that this guy's a deep stater, but that's a topic for another conversation. Now, what is the urgency here? What why do these companies, these chip manufacturers, deserve a handout courtesy of the taxpayer? Isn't this an investment in their own companies? Don't we have a system of capitalism? Private companies make their own investments in the economy since they reap all the profits? Why do they need a handout? Maybe you're going to say, hey, these chip manufacturers, chip companies, uh, they've been struggling financially. They don't have the money and the means to build these gigantic factories. Well, Intel last year made a revenue of $79 billion and profits of almost $20 billion. Profits, not revenue. Profits. What about Qualcomm, another U.S.-based chip maker? Last year, they made almost $33.5 billion in revenues, and they made almost $9 billion in profits. Texas Instruments, another U.S.-based chip maker, made a revenue worth $18 billion last year, and profits worth $8 billion. NVIDIA made revenues of $27 billion last year, and profits of $10 billion. Another giant company that would benefit from this act, since they have their own chips now, Apple. Apple last year made a revenue of almost $366 billion, and a profit of $95 billion. But all oh, the poverty. These companies need a handout from the taxpayer. They need $52 billion before they start investing in the economy. They need us to build their factories for them. Does that make sense to anybody at all? Ralph Nader says, Why are the Democrats and the GOP in Congress passing a $52 billion corporate welfare bill for the super profitable and grossly undertaxed chip industry to get them to build plants in the USA to make more profits? Question mark. Does this make sense to anybody? Any taxpayer thinks that this is okay? What a rigged system that we have. But again, the blackmailing continues. If you don't give us the handout, courtesy of the taxpayer, we're not going to do so and so. Here he is again, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. But my message to uh, our congressional leaders is, hey, if I'm not done with the job, I don't get to go home. Neither should you. Do not go home for August recess until you have passed the CHIPS Act, because I and others in the industry will make investment decisions. And do you want those investments in the U.S.? Or are we simply not competitive in this to do them here? And we need to go to Europe or Asia for those. Get the job done. Do not go home for August recess without getting these bills passed. So he says, if you don't give me the free cash, I got to make decisions here. I might have to invest not in the United States, but in Germany, in uh, Europe, in Asia, other countries. In other words, give me the money now. Otherwise, I might cost you the elections. Blackmailing politicians. Well, guess what? The headline for March 15th, 2022 reads, 
Germany wins big as Intel spreads chip investment across six EU countries. What are they talking about? Here's another headline. Intel commits $36 billion to making chips in Europe. Da -da -da -da. All of a sudden, they have a spare $36 billion to manufacture chips in Europe. But in this country, they need a handout first. They need a $52 billion handout by the taxpayer. Why spend the money? Why invest when you have a corrupt system where the politicians pass billions of taxpayer money as handouts to these corporations? And the blackmailing by the chip industry is not just happening against politicians. It is also happening against us, the public, the taxpayer, brainwashing us through the media, through social media, that this is of vital importance. If you don't do this, inflation will go higher and America will be at disadvantage. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger says chips are the new oil. U.S. needs to produce more of its own. Does that mean that the U.S. takes over Intel, nationalizes the company? Then it's okay. We'll spend whatever billions we need to build the factories. But who gets to keep the profits from these factories? The answer is Intel. So why are we giving them a free handout? How about national security? That's the excuse that they use for everything. Any abuse of taxpayer money, they use national security as the excuse. Take a listen to the CEO of another giant chip manufacturer, Micron. We must get this done. We must get this done, otherwise U.S. will fall behind. Foreign governments have been investing for decades, lot of investment, putting in lot of investments into the semiconductor industry. And of course, they have also recently further added to their investments. And it's not only him. Yesterday, the CEO of Lockheed Martin came out on CNBC and said, we got to pass the CHIP Act. Otherwise, this will be a national security concern. We have to do it because of national security, yada, yada, yada. But hey, Maverick, what about China? We got to build our own chips here in the United States so we don't have to depend on China. Okay, China happens to export about 35% of the entire supply of chips versus only 5% by the United States. You got a point here. Likewise, when it comes to imports, China only imports 10.5% of the global supply of chips, while the United States imports 12.2%. There is another problem. It was one country, the United States and China, depend on for chip manufacturing. And that country, well, we call it a country here because, thank God, we're in freedom, at least for now, in the United States. But in China, you wouldn't call it a country. It's called Taiwan. Taiwan happens to be the largest manufacturer of chips on the planet, specifically a company by the name of TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor. They manufacture the majority of chips on the planet. Qualcomm, Intel, AMD, they design the chips, but it is Taiwan that manufacture them. What is the problem with Taiwan? Well, we know that China is going to invade Taiwan sooner or later. It is inevitable at this point. It's going to happen. And if it does happen, China will have a monopoly over the supply of chips. China is already threatening the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, not to visit Taiwan. Tensions are rising. Sooner or later, China will capture Taiwan. And this is the strongest point that the advocates for this CHIP Act have. But pretty please, if you're going to tell me that China is a source of threat and it is a matter of vital importance to our national security to give a handout worth $52 billion to Intel to build factories in this country, pretty please tell Intel to stop apologizing to this great enemy and threat that we call China. Because Intel keeps apologizing and appeasing China over and over and over and over again. And the bottom line is, you might say, hey Maverick, we know the system is not fair, it is all corrupt, but we can't let China win this. We have to produce our chips here at home. It is of national security concern. I get it. At some point, we have to produce chips at home. We have to move manufacturing out of China all the way back to home here, the United States. But the question is, how do we do that while preserving the capitalist system? Why do we have to give these companies multi-billion dollars worth of handout when they make billions of dollars in profits? How come we cannot just give them a loan or tax credits after they build their own factories? And if we're going to do it for them, what do we get as taxpayers? What kind of perks do we get? Do we get a share of the profits? Do we get cheap access to chips? Do we get a sustainable investment in jobs? Do we get anything at all? Do we even have somebody negotiating on our behalf in this deal in the government right now? The answer is no, because your beloved politicians, they don't work for you. They work for the oligarchs. So who's negotiating on behalf of taxpayers in this deal? Don't we deserve at least 
something out of this deal after we funded it after we're investing in these companies how come we don't get any returns at all meanwhile your beloved politicians they're making money already from this deal do you remember paul pelosi who happens to be the husband of the speaker of the house nancy pelosi well apparently when he's not drinking and driving with his gomar and when he's not motorboarding nancy's jugs he's doing insider trading mr pelosi bought millions of dollars worth of nvidia stock ahead of the chip manufacturing bill vote. The expectations are the bill will pass. No surprise here. Isn't this insider trading? Of course, the guy, instead of buying Intel, he doesn't want to make it so obvious, he bought NVIDIA instead. We all know that the stock market works via ETFs. If Intel pops higher, the video will pop higher too. But this is the filth, the corrupt system that we're living in. They talk about the CHIP Act as of vital importance to national security, to tackle inflation. The reality is it doesn't do any of that. The reality is this is just another handout by the government of our taxpayer money to the chip manufacturers, chip makers who are already swimming in profits, billions of billions of dollars. What do we, the taxpayers, get back in return for this investment? Because that's what it is. It's an investment. The difference is when venture capitalists do it, they get a return. When the taxpayer does it, you get nothing. Oh, you're saying that you built the factory for Intel? Sorry, you still got to pay for the chips. Once again, this is nothing but a lousy deal. That's all there is. But with that, folks, we got to move on here and cover the stock market information for you. We start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average was in the green by 754.44 points, or a gain of 2.43%. The Nasdaq leading the gains with 353.10 points, or a gain of 3.11%. The S&P 500 also in the green by 105.84 points, or a gain of 2.76%. What about the sector's performances today? All in the green. We're not going to shame anybody here. Yet coming up at number one, capturing the gold medal, industrials, number two for the silver, technology, number three for the bronze, cyclicals. Now, what about the advance to decline ratios? NYC, 89% advancing versus 9% declining. The NASDAQ, 77% advancing versus 18% declining. Commodities, what's going on here? Crude continues to build on the gain, but be it modest gains today, both the WTI and Brent scoring gains of about 1% apiece. Gasoline, the RBOP futures, also gaining about 1%, while heating oil was muted for the day. On the other hand, natural gas was down, losing ground for about 2.5%. Now, while U.S. natural gas prices went down today, European natural gas prices are surging higher. And the reason is the heat wave. Look at this. 91 in London, 99 in Paris, Bordeaux, 106. Unbelievable. The wine is going to suck this year. And the problem with all of this is, now with the heat wave, European countries are exhausting their supply of natural gas. The initial plan was, store as much natural gas as you can for the winter season. But now we have the UK, Germany using that storage for now because of the heat wave. Now they have to replenish their storage of natural gas for the upcoming winter season because by then, supposedly, they're not going to import oil and gas from Russia. And of course, the Russians are having the advantage for now, and Putin is using this advantage to taunt Europe. They say, hey, we cannot guarantee natural gas deliveries to European customers due to issues maintenance, a pipeline got struck by lightning, but at the same time, their supplies to China hit all-time highs. So they have the supply, but of course, they're abusing and using their power to taunt Europe into submission, of course. This is a massive problem, and it's going to get worse by the winter season. What about softs? Modest gains for lumber, coffee futures, yet sizable gains for OJ futures, scoring gains of about 2.5%, and then cocoa futures also closing with gains of about 1% for the day. On the other hand, we have modest declines for cotton futures, while sugar was the loser for the day, losing ground of about 2.5%. Metals, what's going on here? We have a pullback for copper and silver. Gold remains muted, waiting and seeing as if gold saying, I'm not buying what the dollar is doing. Even though the euro went higher today, the Australian dollar, the Kiwi, all surging higher, and that pushed the dollar down. But for some reason, gold is not believing this action. As if gold is saying, wait a minute here, the dollar is pulling another trick, and sooner or later is going to pop higher again. Meanwhile, we got gains in metals for platinum and palladium, be it modest gains for the day. What about meats? 
Green across the board, and the gains were led by feeder cattle futures, followed by lean hogs, and then live cattle futures with modest gains for the day. What about grains? We have a mixed picture here. We got gains for oats, rough rice, and soybean meal futures, while wheat was muted for the day. On the other hand, soybeans, soybean oil, corn, and canola futures closed the day with notable losses, and perhaps we will see more softening in grains futures. And the reason is we have talks that maybe Ukraine and Russia are closer to a deal to end the blockade and ports to export grains. And such a deal will impact corn and wheat negatively. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest table by far was Apple at around 1.1 million contracts traded today. About 46% of those were calls. At number two, Amazon at around 800,000 contracts, about 57% of those were calls. Notice that the volume is down all in all, and despite the positive activities that we got today in the market, we're not seeing participation in buying call options, and this is a big problem when we talk about the sustainability of the rally. But regardless, Netflix came up number three at around 700,000 contracts, about 39% of those were calls. So they were betting for a disappointment after the bell. They bought more puts. What happened after the bell? Netflix moved higher big time and the reason is all of that short covering. You short before, if you buy put options, you get a scramble after hours to fix the trade and cover your losses and that exacerbates the gains after hours. The problem is Netflix has the tendency of popping after hours after earnings when it does report positive earnings but then it gives up the majority of these gains the very next day. Are we going to see the same phenomenon? Well, at least yours truly hoping that that will happen because the genius that I am, I did buy call options on Netflix today, but I bought a calendar spread for the 210. I saw the 210 calls with the expiration date of this Friday, and I bought the 210 calls with the expiration date of next week. Here's the problem. At least in the post-market activities, Netflix is trading well above 210. What does that mean? Yes. The stock moved in the direction that I wanted, but there was such a thing as too good. And the reason is, I bought the 210 calls for the expiration date of next week, and I paid around 11 bucks and 25 cents a piece. And then I saw the 210 calls for the expiration date of this week, and I received about 9 bucks and 65 cents a piece as credit. All in all, my entry cost is at around 1 buck and 6 cents a piece. Now, remember, I always say that the secret behind the success in options trading is 50% the construction of the trade, 40% the management of the trade, and 10% luck. Well, I'm done with the construction i cannot go back here and up my call range so now i have to rely on the management of the trade now the trade can be profitable right from the get-go in the morning if the time premium is worth more than one buck and six cents a piece but what if it goes down to one buck to less than one buck then i'm losing the trade what if it goes higher to two bucks a piece i'm making money but not as much as i thought not as much as i wanted so how do we deal with this trade here's the four hours chart for netflix we have a big gap and the gap is at around 346.18 now we're gonna open gapping higher no doubt about it maybe not as much as you're seeing right now in the post market but we're gonna open up gapping higher if netflix surges higher all the way in a straight shot to 346.18 maybe more than that by the expiration date then what i would do is close the calls that i sold pay that premium buy them back to close the short leg of the trade and then allow the long leg to ride higher all the way till expiration that is of course assuming that this scenario will happen but what if the most likely scenario takes place instead which is the chart opens higher at 215 218 214 doesn't matter and then we see some profit taking that is natural it's going to happen folks are taking profits right away and we see netflix moving down perhaps closer to 210 maybe even below that what is that going to do the short leg with the expiration date of this week will depreciate in value significantly. That will allow me to buy it back at a cheaper price. And then, assuming we get a rebound after that, I allow the long leg to ride higher all the way till expiration, maybe close it before that. But the point being is, it appreciates in value and it gains more than what I paid for, the one buck and 60 cents a piece. Now, what if the worst case scenario happened? What if Netflix opens gapping higher, but then it shoots down, straight down, selling taking profits all the way till it closes the gap or even turns negative believe it or not what do we do 
in this scenario. If I believe that Netflix will rebound higher after closing the gap, or from the support or from whatever point it would make sense to close the short leg at a cheaper price and then average down on the longer leg by buying more contracts and allow that to appreciate as the stock rebounds higher again. Now, in all likelihood, which scenario is more likely to happen? The answer is the stock opens gapping higher, it moves down as we see profit taking, Hopefully, it gets closer to 210, 209, and I get to close the short leg, buy it back, and be done with it. And then we see a rebound. Netflix moves higher again, above 210, 215, maybe 220. The higher it goes, the better. And the long leg appreciates in value. Now, if that didn't make sense to you, if this sounds like alien language to you, let me know in the comments. Maybe you're not familiar with options trading, but even if you're not, you should be catching up with these examples. You should be catching a thing or two at least. Anyhow, moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker NKLA. Nikola, remember that one? The tragedy of Nikola? Well, somebody's bidding for a rebound here. They bought the six bucks calls for the expiration date, August 5th, with expectations that Nikola could rebound higher and gain more than 6% by then they paid around 42 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1.7 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker c for citibank the name popped higher after earnings and somebody is betting for more gains to come they bought the 56 calls for the expiration date, August 19th, with expectations that Citi could move higher and gain more than 7.5% by then. They paid around 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $900,000. What about the ticker CCL, Carnival Cruises? The name popped higher today, but be careful, trade these names don't invest in them i made a video about it these kind of companies will go down to zero if the economy dips into a recession and interest rates move significantly higher but for now we have a bit that ccl could catch a summer rally at least somebody bought the 11 bucks calls for the expiration date august 19th with expectations that ccl could rebound and move higher by more than six percent by then they paid around 69 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars what about the trade for the ticker t triple q's this is the leverage index for the nasdaq it gains three times with the q's gain in a day somebody bought calls in these expecting more gains for the nasdaq they bought the 32 calls for the expiration date august 5th with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 12 and a half percent by then they paid around 85 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars what about the ticker axp for american express the name is reporting earnings this friday somebody's bidding for a pop to happen they bought the 160 calls for the expiration date august 19th with expectations that axp could move higher and gain more than eight percent by then they paid around two bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one and a half million dollars at the bottom of the table what about the ticker pypl paypal somebody's betting the other way around fading the rip buying puts in paypal the 70 bucks puts for the expiration date august 26 with expectations that paypal could lose ground by more than 10 percent by then they paid around three bucks and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around two and a half million dollars moving on to the heat map what's going on here nothing is going on we have the tide that lifted all boats everything in the green almost with very few exceptions specifically names that reported earnings we have j and j that's down for the obvious reasons reported earnings in the morning ibm is down it reported earnings last night and then we have the chinese ev manufacturers li auto neo xpeng all losing ground today can we get anything here any theme of course not. We have an algorithmic pump today for whatever reason, a technical pump. Maybe the dollar is down. Maybe yields are cooling off. Maybe the 75 basis points instead of 100. Who knows? Well, we know it was an algorithmic buying today, lifting all boats. But soon enough, we're going to sort through these gains. And we will see who's the last man and woman standing. We know that we live in a bipolar market. We cannot have everything rallying together. Either it's going to be value or growth, inflationary or disinflationary, etc., etc. Here's some corporate news for you. We have important earnings tomorrow from Tesla, and already we're starting on the wrong foot here. Reverend Elon Musk was dealt a blow today by the court in Delaware. Apparently, Team Musk wanted to delay the case all the way till February of next year. The judge rejected that and actually agreed with Twitter for an expedited date, and that date will be in October. So tick-tock for Reverend Elon. He's going to lose billions of dollars in this deal. And it doesn't stop here for Tesla. The headline reads, Tesla forced to pay for owner's $115,000 car over its dangerous autopilot. 
What are they talking about? Here it is. A regional court in Munich, also known as München, ordered the car maker to reimburse a customer the bulk of $115,000 she paid for her Model X crossover because its autopilot function could not navigate city, city streets properly. And phantom braking issues proved a massive danger, quote-unquote, urban traffic safety. Here we go, here we go. And then we have uh, YouTube, news for Google. YouTube will let creators sell products directly through Shopify partnership. So apparently if I do a store in Shopify, I can sell you shit directly right away from my store. YouTube doesn't get a cut. You've been asking. And I'm going to deliver for you. Farts in a jar coming soon in the Maverick Wall Street store on Shopify. Stay tuned. In the meantime, we're moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. What's going on here? Once again, the tide that lifted all boats. Everything is in the green. Growth, value, commodities, gold, biotech, cyclicals, retail, chips. Everything is in the green. Even international markets all in the green. Now that's too good to be true. We're going to sort through these gains in upcoming days and perhaps upcoming weeks, specifically after the Fed rate decision next week. So let's move on to charts and we start with SPY, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Yesterday, I talked about shaking it off, that the market has the tendency of uh, channeling its inner Taylor Swift when it comes to bad news such as Apple freezing hiring whatever what do you know today we got the gap higher if you shorted the spy yesterday based on the apple news you woke up with a massive warm pie right in the face because the spy surged higher right off the gate it was above 385 and it beat the next resistance at around 388.71 even the one after that the soft resistance at around 389.82 what if the spy continues to build more gains where is the next resistance you might ask the answer is if we zoom out we have the previous resistance at around 393.16 but watch out for the rsi it is getting a little overbought meaning we could see a pullback if we get the pullback we have 388.71 as support but before that we also have 389.82 as support so plenty of support the most likely scenario though is we get a gap higher above 393.16 in the morning and then we see a pullback the question is what happens after losing that support what happens after closing the gap are we going to see more dip buying or are we going to see a flush down and a reversal a gap and crap that remains to be seen what about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the spy the good news is the support of 3855 has been recaptured once again and the chart is now facing 3960 as the next resistance can it do it in one shot by tomorrow that is possible but most importantly can the chart close the week above 3960 that will be a major win for the bulls but remember we don't want to build too much gains right before the fed's meeting because if the chart shoots up higher in a short amount of time and it goes to 4100 let's say maybe a little beyond that before the fed meeting then the fed might read that as a permission to do the 100 basis points hikes and that in turn will upset the stock market what about the cues 30 minutes chart what's going on here we got the shake it off the gap higher right off the gate and guess what the chart finally made it above 297 and a half the problem is it's overextended right now in the rsi Mer a pullback the counter to that is we have netflix gapping higher and the assumption is it's going to open gapping higher meaning we will see the queues also opening gapping higher the risk becomes what if we get the gap and crap if that is the case and i believe it is the it is the most likely scenario if that is the case will the dip buyers show up again and buy the dip right around 297 and a half that will be bullish if not if we see a flush down and we start to lose 297 and a half 295 293 then we got Got a problem here now maverick where is the resistance that we could see the gap and crap coming from how about we zoom out we have number one 299.28 and then we have 307.41 but in all likelihood we have 305 before that we'll take it one step at a time it doesn't really matter which number we're going to get the gap and crap from if the equities trade as we're seeing after hours we will open gapping up higher and then come the gap and crap from whatever point it happens from keep your eyes on the rebound whether it happens or not and that will happen if the dollar goes down if yields stay cool and most importantly we see if the gap and crap happens in netflix if we see a rebound 
rebound after the initial selling. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ? Here it is. The momentum indicator is still green, still positive. The volume still below average. All of these are good signs for the bulls. On top of that, they captured another support line, used to be resistance, which is 12,207, maintaining higher lows. So far, so good. Now the chart is eyeing 12,766. A closing above that by the end of the week will be a major, major win for the bulls, indicating a summer rally around the corner. What about the IWM 30 minutes chart? What's going on here? Once again, we got the gap all the way, no stopping at all, closing at the highs of the day, above 174.22, right around the resistance. What is that resistance, Maverick? If we zoom out, here it is a previous gap at around 178.60. Now the chart is getting a little overextended. That doesn't mean we cannot see the gap and crap scenario, just like we talked with SPY and the Qs. And the question becomes, will we see a rebound after the crap, after the initial selling? That will be bullish. But here's the most important chart we have to watch, the Dixie, the dollar index. It is pulling down for now. It appears that we have a tradable top, at least for now, which means we have a tradable bottom in the equities market. We have a tradable bottom in commodities too. The MACD indicator is showing us red impressions of the histogram, but the week is still young. The RSI pulled down. All of these are signs that we're seeing weakness in the US dollar. And as the Australian dollar and the Kiwi firming up, maybe if the pound joins the rally, maybe if the yen starts to turn around. I'm reading headlines that the Japanese central bank is keeping rates as is. How will the yen respond? If it does respond positively, then you got the pound, you got the euro, you got the yen, the Kiwi, the dollar, Australian dollar moving higher. All of that will push the US dollar down. And that will be good for commodities and good for equities to continue to march on. But there is one warning signal here coming from gold. Gold, the mature guy in the room, doesn't like to rally without certainty that the dollar is done moving higher. Well, gold is not moving higher. Is gold saying that the dollar is faking it? If that is the case and we see a rebound in the US dollar, then forget about it. The rally will frizzle out and we will see more downside for equities. Look at what happened to IBM, even Netflix, after hours. Both companies are complaining about the exchange rate, that the higher dollar damaged their bottom lines. We will see the same tune coming from more companies as we get more earnings. The dollar has to go down. It's simply too high right now. What about Brent? Four hours chart. What's going on here? We're seeing the bull flag consolidation at around the resistance. Now support of 105.84 playing out. We got the pop. If the pop continues, we have 114. The problem is if crude goes all the way back to 114, then equities are not going to respond positively because that will indicate that the Fed maybe has to be more aggressive in the next meeting. Not 75, but 100 basis points. So watch out for that. Here it is, the 10-year yield. What's going on here? The RSI and the MACD indicators are suggesting that we will see a pop higher. And already the 10-year yield is above 3% at least for now. Keyword for now. I don't believe that we're going to have a sizable move one way or the other right now until we get the Fed meeting next week. In the meantime, can the TLT recover and move higher again? This is a weekly chart. For now, it remains trading within the range of last week. It went negative for the week so far, but the week is still young. We have positive indicators that the worst is behind us in the TLT, but the chart is not going to play out. We're not going to see the short covering rally in the TLT until after the Fed meeting. And that depends whether the decision comes out as dovish or hawkish. Dovish means TLT moves higher. Hawkish means 100 basis points or more, TLT will go down. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. What's going on here? It remains in negative momentum for now, but it is holding on, holding on to the support of 24.29. It caught support once, twice, a third time, but you can look at it the other way. It knocked the support of 24.29 once, twice, a third time, sooner or later, that support is going to crack and we will see a flush down in the VIX. Now, SPY bears would argue no. If anything, the retest confirms that 24.29 is solid and we will see a rebound rally in the VIX, meaning the SPY goes down. We'll see who wins tomorrow. You'll know once that support line is breached or it produces a pop higher. What about the VXN four hours chart? What's going on here? It lost the most important support, in my opinion, which is 32.72. It is forming a bear flag pattern for now. This is from a four hours perspective. The assumption is the bear flag will play out. Whether it gets us all the way down to 27 and a half or not, that remains to be seen. But if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, and I'm assuming that we're going to see a gap and crap in the Qs and the SPY. And by the way, when I say gap and crap, I don't mean a gap higher and then a flush down 
or we see a crash in the NASDAQ. And the, no, 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 no. I'm seeing an initial gap higher and a pullback, profit taking, and then we'll see what happens. Are the dip buyers going to show up or not? If that is the case, then the bear flag in the VXN will play out and then we will see dip buying in the VXN as we see profit taking in the Qs and the SPY right off the gate in the morning. These are all assumptions. Nothing is guaranteed here. What about Apple, a daily chart? What's going on here? Yesterday, we talked about the shake it off. And here it is. Apple shook it off like nothing happened. It's back above 150. It is support for now. And it appears that Apple wants to go higher. Now, how high can it go? The answer is we have resistance at 157. But before that, we have the trend line in yellow. Depending on how fast the pop will happen in Apple, that could act as resistance before 157. Next, what about Tesla, the souffle? What's going on here? Nothing to see. We got a rebound. After closing the gap at 720 and a half, excuse me, 720.11, we have earnings tomorrow. If the NASDAQ opens gapping higher in the morning, the assumption is Tesla will move higher too. But this is a name that is becoming increasingly risky, not just because of the chaos with Elon Musk and Twitter, but we know the number is going to be bad. We know Tesla is missing on the Chinese numbers in Shanghai. How will the price increases and the demand in Europe and USA offset the lack of demand from China, at least during the shutdowns. Lots of risk here, given the fact that the stock is overvalued, as is right now. What does that mean? We could see de-risking, profit-taking before earnings, and that could push the stock down all the way to 720.11 or all the way down even 700. Long shot, but it could happen. Now, do we have any options trade before earnings for Tesla? The answer is yes, we have plenty. Lots of spread ideas, but I don't have the brain capacity right now to discuss all of that. I'll do that tomorrow in the morning, but for now, let's move on to Bitcoin. Here's a two hours chart. We're done with this chart right now because Bitcoin completed the objective here. It made a series of higher lows over and over and over again. It kept 19,550 support. It passed the resistance of 20,450. Not only that, it broke the next resistance at around 22,490. So we have to move back to the daily chart. We will look at that. What is the next resistance? We have the top of the breakdown candle, which happens to be at around 26,555. Let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Overnight in the EU, we have the consumer confidence index. And then in the morning in the US, we're going to have existing home sales. What about the earnings calendar? We have United Airlines in the morning along with CSX. And after the bell, the big one, Tesla. Buckle up your seat belts. But this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow. We're just supposed to walk out of there with $150 billion in cash on us without getting stopped? Yeah. <laughs>